Haji Murat, also written Haji Murat Russian, Hadzimurat, Romanized, Kaji Murat A, is a novella written by Leo Tolstoy from 1896 to 1904 and published posthumously in 1912 though not in full until 1917. Its titular protagonist Haji Murat is an Avar rebel commander who, for reasons of personal revenge, forges an uneasy alliance with the Russians he has been fighting. Haji Murad Russian, Haji Murad, Avar, Exaz Murad, 1818 5 May OS. The 23rd of April 1852 was an important North Caucasian Avar leader during the resistance of the peoples of Dagestan and Chechnya in 1811 1864 against the incorporation of the region into the Russian Empire. The Avars, also known as Maharuls Avar, Magarulo, 5, 6, 7, M -A -A -R -U -L -A -L, Mountaineers, are a Northeast Caucasian ethnic group. The Avars are the largest of several ethnic groups living in the Russian Republic of Dagestan. 8. The Avars reside in the North Caucasus between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. Alongside other ethnic groups in the North Caucasus region, the Avars live in ancient villages located approximately 2,000 meters above sea level. 9. The Avar language spoken by the Caucasian Avars belongs to the family of Northeast Caucasian languages. Sunni Islam has been the prevailing religion of the Avars since the 14th century. Count Lev Nikolaevich Tolstoy, Note 1, Tolst, TL1, Russian, Lev Nikolaevich Tolstoy, Note 2, IPA, Lev Enkla J, BT Tolstoy, I, the 9th of September, OS, the 28th of August, 1828, the 20th of November, OS, the 7th of November, 1910, 2, usually referred to in English as Leo Tolstoy, was a Russian writer. He is regarded as one of the greatest and most influential authors of all time. 3. 4. He received nominations for the Nobel Prize in Literature every year from 1902 to 1906 and for the Nobel Peace Prize in 1901, 1902, and 1909. Born into an aristocratic family, Tolstoy's notable works include the novels War and Peace 1869 and Anna Karenina 1878 5, often cited as pinnacles of realist fiction, 2, and two of the greatest books of all time. 3, 4, he first achieved literary acclaim in his 20s with his semi-autobiographical trilogy, Childhood, Boyhood, and Youth, 1852-1856, and Sevastopol Sketches, 1855, based upon his experiences in the Crimean War. His fiction includes dozens of short stories such as, After the Ball, 1911, and several novellas such as The Death of Ivan Ilyich, 1886, Family Happiness, 1859, and Haji. Murad, 1912. He also wrote plays and essays concerning philosophical, moral and religious themes. In the 1870s, Tolstoy experienced a profound moral crisis, followed by what he regarded as an equally profound spiritual awakening, as outlined in his nonfiction work Confession, 1882. His literal interpretation of the ethical teachings of Jesus, centering on the Sermon on the Mount, caused him to become a fervent Christian anarchist and pacifist. 2. His ideas on nonviolent resistance, expressed in such works as The Kingdom of God is Within You, 1894, had a profound impact on such pivotal 20th century figures as Mahatma Gandhi, 6. Martin Luther King Jr., 7, and Ludwig Wittgenstein. 8. He also became a dedicated advocate of Georgism, the economic philosophy of Henry George, which he incorporated into his writing, particularly in his novel Resurrection, 1899. Tolstoy received praise from countless authors and critics, both during his lifetime and after. Virginia Woolf called Tolstoy, the greatest of all novelists, 9, and Gary Saul Morrison referred to War and Peace as the greatest of all novels. 10, Tolstoy never having won a Nobel Prize was a major Nobel Prize controversy, and remains one. 11, 12. Inspiration. Edit. The theme of struggle while remaining faithful resonated with Tolstoy even though he was in ailing health, Later letters suggest this work gave him a brief, final moment of vigor. Just as the author was struggling with his near death, his extended meditation on the concept of the individual refusing to give in to the demands of the world helped him to complete the book, although he himself had no inclination to publish it and was only concerned with its completion. In addition to the theme of resistance, there are many other ideas that can be found in the novel, such as determinism, this echoes Tolstoy's major work War and Peace. An even clearer theme is the struggle between a Christian Russia and Muslim Caucasian imamate, the classic West versus East theme found in Russian history in many different stories and novels, and which is once again pertinent in light of First and Second Chechen Wars in Chechnya and Russia. The work is very similar to Alexander Pushkin's historical novel The Captain's Daughter, 1836, in that it is a realist. 
work based on actual people and events and has a similar direction, though the main character in this novel does not meet the same end. Tolstoy used material in Russian archives, including Haji Murad's own account of his life. Historical Context Edit Tolstoy created this story in reference to the Caucasus Mountains during the mid-19th century in Russia. During this time period, an imperial conquest ensued between the Chechen Dagestani and the Russian military. The Russian military had expectations to expand upon their empire. Haji Murad is also linked with Tolstoy's own experiences in the military. He wrote to his brother in 1851, If you wish to show off with news, you may recount that a certain Haji Murad surrendered a few days ago to the Russian government. He was the leading daredevil and brave of all Chechnya, but has been led into committing a mean action. 2. In the book he described the experiences of the Caucasian and Russian struggle that both he and Haji Murad were caught up in. Although it was written about 50 years after. The events of the story actually happened Tolstoy paints a picture of actual Russian civilization at the time. He portrays the differences between the bureaucratic decay and the healthy passionate life of a mountaineer. 3. Plot Summary Edit. The narrator prefaces the story with his comments on a crushed, but still living thistle he finds in a field, a symbol for the main character, after which he begins to tell the story of Haji Murat, a successful and famed guerrilla who falls out with his own commander and eventually sides with the Russians in hope of saving his family. Haji Murat's family is being contained and controlled by Imam Shamil, the Avar leader who abducted his mother, two wives, and five children. Aside from the fact that Murat wants to save his family, he additionally wants to avenge the deaths of other family members. The story opens with Murad and two of his followers fleeing from Shamil, the commander of the Caucasian warriors, who is at war with the Russians. They find refuge at the house of Sado, a loyal supporter of Murad. The local people learn of his presence and chase him out of the village. His lieutenant succeeds in making contact with the Russians, who promise to meet Murad. He eventually arrives at the fortress of Vozdvizhenskaya to join the Russian forces, in hopes of drawing their support in order to overthrow Shamil and save his family. Before his arrival, a small skirmish occurs with some Chechen and Dagestani mountaineers outside the fortress, and Petruka Avdeyev, a young Russian soldier, dies in a local military hospital after being shot. Tolstoy makes a chapter-length aside about Petruka. Childless, he volunteered as a conscript in place of his brother who had a family of his own. Petruka's father regrets this because he was a dutiful worker compared to his complacent brother. While at Vozdvizhenskaya, Murat befriends Prince Semyon Vorontsov, the viceroy's son, his wife Maria and his son, and wins over the goodwill of the soldiers stationed there. They are at once in awe of his physique and reputation, and enjoy his company and find him honest and upright. The Vorontsovs give him a present of a watch which fascinates him. On the fifth day of Murat's stay, the governor-general's adjutant, Mikhail Loris Melikov arrives with orders to write down Murat's story, and the reader learns some of his history. He was born in the village of Selms and early on became close to the local cons due to his mother being the royal family's wet nurse. When he was 15 some followers of Muradism came into his village calling for a holy war Gazavat against Russia. Murat declines at first but after a learned man is sent to explain how it will be run, he tentatively agrees. However, in their first confrontation, Shamil, then a lieutenant for the Muslims hostile to the Russians, embarrasses Murat when he goes to speak with the leader Hamzat. Hamzat eventually launches an attack on the capital of Kunzik and kills the pro-Russian Khans, taking control of this part of Dagestan. The slaughter of the Khans throws Haji and his brother against Hamzat, and they eventually succeed in tricking and killing him, causing his followers to flee. Unfortunately, Murat's brother is killed in the attempt and Shamil replaces Hamzat as leader. He calls on Murat to join his struggle, but Murat refuses because the blood of his brother and the Khans are on Shamil. Once Murat has joined the Russians, who are aware of his position and bargaining ability, they find him the perfect tool for getting to Shamil. However, Vorontsov's plans are ruined by the war minister, Chernyshov, a rival prince who is jealous of him, and Murat has to remain in the fortress. Because the Tsar is told he is possibly a spy. The story digresses into a depiction of the Tsar Nicholas I of Russia, which reveals his lethargic and bitter nature and his egotistical complacency, as well as his contempt towards women, his brother-in-law Frederick William IV of Prussia, and Russian students. The Tsar orders an attack on the mountaineers and Murat remains in the fortress. Meanwhile, Murat's mother, wife and eldest son Yusuf, whom Shamil hold captive, are moved to a more defensible location. 
Realizing his position neither trusted by the Russians to lead an army against Shamil, nor able to return to Shamil because he will be killed, Haji Murat decides to flee the fortress to gather men to save his family. At this point the narrative jumps forward in time, to the arrival of a group of soldiers at the fortress bearing Murat's severed head. Maria Dmitrievna, the companion of one of the officers and a friend of Murat, comments on the cruelty of men during times of war, calling them, butchers. The soldiers then tell the story of Murat's death. He had escaped the fortress and shook off his usual Russian escort with the help of his five lieutenants. After they escape they come upon a marsh that they are unable to cross, and hide amongst some bushes until the morning. An old man gives away their position and Karganov, the commander of the fortress, the soldiers, and some Cossacks surround the area. Haji Murad and his men fortify themselves and begin to fire upon the troops, dying valiantly. Haji himself runs into fire after his men are killed, despite being wounded and plugging up his fatal wounds in his body with cloth. As he fires his last bullet his life flashes before him and the soldiers think he's dead, he gets up for one final struggle and falls to his death. Victorious, the Russian soldiers fall upon and decapitate him. The nightingales, which stopped singing during the battle, begin again and the narrator ends by recalling the thistle once more. Character List Edit Haji Murad The story is about Haji wrestling with joining the Russians against their Caucasian adversaries to defeat a foe Shamil who captured his mother, wives, and children. He is an Avar Caucasian warrior who was formerly as Russian appointed governor of Avaria and currently Shamil's chief representative there. Haji has a very distinct appearance. Black eyes, shaved head, sunburned hands, skinny yet muscular arms, and most importantly a limp. Haji received this limp while he was escaping from Ahmed Khan. He has many different personality traits that range from very intimidating to very kind. Shamil. Shamil is the leader of the Caucasian rebels, who is determined to clash with the Russians. He is very tall, powerful and charismatic. He holds Haji Murat's family and loved ones captive and threatens them so he can draw Haji to where he is so that he can kill him. Prince Mikhail Semyonovich Vorontsov. This prince is one of the major commanders of the Russians. His wealth and connections enable him to be a great leader and to get people to follow him. He is vital to the plot because he is the only Russian commander to whom Haji Murat will submit and listen. Vorontsov does not give Haji everything that he wants, like trading POWs for his family. However, Vorontsov does let Haji move freely about Russia in search of his family. Petruka Avdeyev. He is a young Russian soldier who bleeds to death in a local military hospital after being shot in a small skirmish outside the fortress. An entire chapter is dedicated to explaining his life. He has no children and volunteered as a conscript in place of his brother who had a family of his own. Nicholas I. A very authoritarian and bitter czar of Russia. He is very egotistical and treats women and those who are close to him poorly. This includes Frederick William IV of Prussia and Russian students. Maria Dmitrievna. She befriends Murat and becomes troubled by the cruelty of men during times of war when she sees his severed head. She expresses her feelings towards some soldiers who then told her the story of his death. Themes. Edit. Haji Murat is very different than the other works Tolstoy produced around the same time. In The Devil 1889, The Kreutzer Sonata 1890, Father Sergius, 1898, Resurrection 1899, Master and Man, 1895, and The Forged Coupon 1905, the emphasis is on man's moral duties which is not the case in Haji Murat. Tolstoy usually has the protagonists go through a process of purification, where they learn something about an ethical ideal. Haji Murat is a unique story by Tolstoy because this does not occur. Instead in Tolstoy's old age he returned to writing about memories from his youth. Haji Murat is a story that consists of negative themes which is unusual for Tolstoy. He portrays the negative side of man doubting that there is goodness in any man at all. For Rebecca Ruth Gould has described Haji Murat along with Tolstoy's other writings on the Caucasus, as, ethnographic footnotes informing the reader about the history, languages, and customs of Russia's enemies. 5. Symbolism. Edit. The narrator encounters two thistles at the beginning of the story. The first thistle is crimson-colored and very prickly, so he has to go around to avoid it. He desperately wants it for his bouquet, but, while he is trying to uproot it, he accidentally destroys its beauty. Shortly afterward, he finds the second thistle, which has been run over and stands half-broken, though it still looks resilient. After the events unfold, Haji Murat becomes the thistle that grew on Russian soil but is ignored or destroyed. Six. Reception. Edit. 
Influential American literature critic Harold Bloom said of Haji Murat, It is my personal touchstone for the sublime of prose fiction, to me the best story in the world. 7, 8. What's amazing about this scene is not just its brutal realism, but the amazing life Tolstoy invests in this minor character, who we barely meet before he's dispatched to his maker. After a brief snapshot of his death, we're whisked away to his family's farm, where we learn of Dave. Volunteered to fight in the place of his brother, who was older but already had a family. And now the family gets the bitter news that Avdiv is dead, further fraying the splintered threads of guilt and resentment they feel for one another. This approach, which some liken to, head hopping, in modern parlance, is the very, sense of strangeness, that Bloom earlier cites. The book never settles on a true hero of cast of characters, but excitedly travels through the eyes and experiences of everyone, large and small, engaged in the conflict. In one chapter we look through the eyes of Tsar Nicholas I himself, as documented below, and in another, we come face to face with Shamil, a less fearsome creature despite his obvious power than history might have us believe. As a further act of distancing, the story is told by an unnamed narrator, possibly Tolstoy himself, who opens the story with a slender frame narrative, restoring it only at the very end of the story. Yet the opening preface sets the stage for the entire work, which is less a work of history than about history, and how people get inevitably swept up in the wake of human progress. The narrator is reflecting on this as he examines a field of earth that has recently been plowed. Everything is destroyed in an organized, methodical fashion, and yet, a small bush remains, a tartar thistle bush, defiantly poking out of the earth, despite the defeat of its comrades. As the narrator reflects, one shoot has broken off and the remnant of stock stuck out like a severed arm. There was a flower on each of the other two. The flowers had once been red, but were now black. One stalk was broken and its upper half with the soiled flower at the end hung down, the other, though caked with black mud, still stood erect. It was evident that the whole bush had been run over by a cartwheel and had then picked itself up again, for that reason it was standing crookedly, but still it was standing. It was like having part of its body torn away, its innards turned inside out, an arm pulled off, an eye plucked out. But still it was standing and would not surrender to man who had destroyed all its brethren around. This defiant thistle reminds him of Haji Murat, a man who defied both Shamil and the Russian army, and stood defiantly even though his life, and indeed, his way of life, had already surrendered to the dust. Yet it's not just. Haji who is lamented through the metaphor, throughout the story, an entire way of life and thinking seems to be laid to rest. The Russian soldiers who sacrifice themselves in this endless war are themselves thistles, mowed down by the imperial indifference of the Tsar, while they, in turn, ravage the fields and lives of the Caucasians. Perhaps Tolstoy felt how strongly change was in the air, and how the very fields themselves would soon rebel against the farmers. Similar to War and Peace is Tolstoy's contempt for the great men of empire, and standing in for Napoleon as Tsar Nicholas I, who emerges from the shadows of history as a wrathful, boastful tyrant. Tolstoy devotes an entire chapter to his point of view, so we can better appreciate the narrowness of his vision and the inevitable downfall of Russia under his guidance. The following passage is one of his most searing indictments of the powerful, and could be applied to a laundry list of 20th century tyrants, and quite a few in the 21st. The plan for achieving a slow advance into enemy territory, had been put forward by Ermolov and Valyamanov. It was the exact opposite of Nicholas's own plan. Despite this, however, Nicholas also claimed credit for the policy of slow advance, one would have supposed that in order to believe that the plan of slow advance was his plan, he would find it necessary to conceal the fact that he had actually insisted on carrying out the operation of 1845 which was its complete opposite. But he did not conceal it, and, despite the obvious contradiction, prided himself both on his plan, and on the plan for slow advance. The blatant, unceasing flattery of those around him had so far detached him from reality that he was no longer aware of his own inconsistency and ceased to relate his words and actions to reality, logic or plain common sense, fully convinced that all his decisions, however senseless, unjust and consistent they were in fact, became sensible, just and consistent simply by virtue of having been made by him. This is Tolstoy's most clear-eyed criticism of empire, that it breeds soulless despots who make a game of contradiction, delighting in telling the masses that, the sun shines at night, until they accept it as gospel. If fields can only be useful if plowed, then only the useful can be beautiful, thus, thistle bushes, flowers, and inevitably, people, must be blotted out of a blighted landscape. 
only the Tsar and his vision, or whatever vision he chooses to appropriate that day, can remain. Not surprisingly, Tolstoy has far more sympathy for Haji, who emerges as a fascinating contradiction himself. Both a merciless killer and a compassionate father, a man who looks away bashfully when women enter the room, but accepts with equanimity if distaste the fate that will befall his wife and mother if he doesn't liberate them from Shamil both will be gang-raped by the camp. While in many respects Tolstoy views him as a heroic vestige of a simpler, if crueler age, Haji is also wise enough to understand the present moment. He knows, for example, that his people will have to capitulate, and those who refuse will be like Falcon in the old folktale Tolstoy excels at bringing in the folk ideology of the Caucasus. The Falcon, was caught, lived among people and then returned to his home in the mountains. The Falcon returned wearing jesses on his legs and there were bells still on them. And the Falcon spurned him. Fly back to the place where they put silver bells on you, they said. We have no bells, nor do we have jesses. The falcon did not want to leave his homeland and stayed. But the other falcons would not have him and tore him to death. Just as. They will tear me to death, thought Haji Murat. Though thinking primarily of him own return to the mountains, the same is true of all people of the Caucasus. Having accepted Russian arms and technology, having learned Russian words and customs, how can they ever return home? The bells aren't so easily shaken off, and the mountains won't so easily suffer the plow and yoke of Russian domination as endless wars in Afghanistan would prove. Sadly, Haji's defection and subsequent coup falls apart out of sheer bureaucratic indifference. Haji demands the Russians help him free his family from Shamil's camp, but such an order has to be approved from on high, and this person hasn't heard from this one, and this person can't act until such a time, etc. As time is pressing, Haji is forced to flee in the night with his men to make a bold, and suicidal, attack on Shamil's camp. Yet Russian guards stand in the way, who are dispatched, and Haji soon has an entire troop of Russians, along with some native allies, who resent Haji, on his trail. He is quickly gunned down after a brief standoff, and every soldier gets a chance to bayonet his fallen body, much as the Greeks. Once did to a fallen Hector in a very different battlefield. The story ends with this pathetic denouement, leading the narrator to laconically remark, this was the death that was brought to my mind by the crushed thistle in the plowed field. These are the last words of the story, and with them, Tolstoy washes his hands of the story, and of his career in fiction, in one swift stroke. It's an abrupt and hollow conclusion, but in its own way triumphant. For Tolstoy refuses to glorify the past, his nation, or even the hero of his tale. Like the thistle, it merely sinks into the mud, its color fading, its story forgotten. Or not quite forgotten. Few who read this story can ever forget the tragic portraits of men and women stuck in the gears of history, their actions rendered meaningless by so many Nicholases and Shamils. We can't change the past nor demand an accounting of the present, Tolstoy suggests, but we can stand our ground, and force the executioner to look us in the eyes before lopping our heads off. Or as he writes in the preface of the tale, man has conquered everything, destroyed millions of plants, but still this one will not give in. Haji Murat, an Avar rebel commander in late 1851, is on the run after a conflict with his former ally, Imam Shamil, who commands the Caucasian resistance. Murat's family is now being held captive by Shamil, a Chechen leader who is at war with the Russians. With a bounty on Murat in place from Shamil, Murat seeks refuge with an old acquaintance, Sado. Despite the risk involved, Sado offers him shelter, and together, they make plans to contact the Russian Prince Vorontsov for help as Murat seeks to defect to the Russians, hoping to secure his family's safety. Murat successfully contacts the Russian military, who consent to a meeting. He arrives at Fort Vozdvizhensk, intending to garner support to overthrow Shamil and free his family. Upon surrendering to the Russians, Murat's interaction with Prince Vorontsov is laced with skepticism and pride. From Prince Vorontsov's perspective, acquiring Murat is a strategic win, yet he is cautious given Murat's history of battling Russian forces. Conversely, Murat is wary of placing his trust in the Russians because of his religion and his identity as a Chechen. Just before Murat's arrival at Vozdvizhensk, a skirmish between Chechen fighters and Russian troops leads to the death of Avdiv, a Russian soldier who enlisted in place of his brother. At his palace in Tiflis, Mikhail Semyonovich Vorontsov, the viceroy and father of Prince Vorontsov, receives news of Haji Murat's surrender to the Russians. The anticipation of Murat's arrival in Tiflis sparks excitement among Mikhail Vorontsov and his guests, who eagerly exchange stories of Haji Murat's legendary exploits. 
Upon Murat's declaration of loyalty to the Russian Tsar in Tiflis, he commits to battling their mutual adversary, Shamil, and seeks assistance for a military operation to rescue his family from Shamil's capture. In Tiflis, Vorontsov's aide, Loris Melikov, meets with Murat to record his biography. Murat recounts to Loris Melikov his early years, ascension to prominence, military achievements, and the eventual rift with Shamil. He narrates his shame after running away during the murder of his friend Uma Khan, a disgrace that continues to haunt him and propels his future resolve and valor. Mikhail Semyonovich Vorontsov writes to Prince Chernyshov, the Russian war minister, about Haji Murat's defection to the Russians. Vorontsov describes Murat's concern for his family's well-being while also expressing caution about Murat's true intentions. Murat seeks to be relocated closer to Chechnya and requests financial support to facilitate his family's release. Vorontsov, understanding the risk of either placing complete trust in Murat or detaining him, which could dissuade others from defecting, proposes to meet Murat's demands. He plans to provide Murat with a Cossack escort and the support of Captain Loris Melikov. Chernyshov, after receiving Vorontsov's report, criticizes Vorontsov's approach to Emperor Nicholas I, suggesting that relocating Murat to central Russia could prevent potential espionage. However, the emperor, dismissing Chernyshov's concerns, demands Murat remain in the Caucasus. With knowledge of Murat's surrender, Emperor Nicholas orders an intensified campaign against the Chechens, determined to crush their resistance with force. In January 1852, Nicholas's call for an intensified campaign against the Chechens is answered, Russian forces defeat the Chechens after a surprise attack by Shamil's forces. After their win, the Russians ravage a Chechen village, the village where Sato lived. Haji Murat arrives at a Russian fort commanded by Major Petrov, where he is required to stay under strict surveillance. However, he forms bonds with the officers, especially with Butler and Petrov's wife, Maria Dmitrievna. Murat's stay at Major Petrov's leads to developing friendships, and Butler becomes fascinated with Murat's mountain culture. Meanwhile, Murat's family remains under the watch of Shamil in Vidano after his defection. When Shamil returns to Vidano after losing to the Russians in battle, his council plots to lure Murat back using Murat's son, Yusuf, as bait. Murat is sent back to Tiflis. Here, he pushes Vorontsov for a prisoner exchange to free his family and asks for a relocation closer to them. He requests to be sent to Nuka, a city closer to Vidano. Despite receiving money for his family's rescue, news arrives that his allies are too intimidated by Shamil to attempt the rescue. Haji Murat resolves to save his family himself, armed and ready for a potentially deadly mission. Back at the Russian fort, Butler and Maria Dmitrievna receive the chilling revelation of Murat's death through the delivery of his severed head. Butler learns of the story that caused Murat's death and last stand. He attempted to escape from the Russian fort and was followed by Cossack soldiers. When confronted by the Russian militia in a flooded rice field, Murat met his death with bravery and valor. His death resonates with the crushed thistle from the beginning of the story, bringing the narrative full circle. The story ends with a reminder of the crushed thistle, symbolizing the resilience of the human spirit. After opening with comments about a thistle struggling for life, the narrator tells the story of Haji Murat. Once a highly regarded soldier in the Caucasian separatist movement, Haji has begun fighting with the Russians themselves. His family is kidnapped by Imam Shamil, the Avar. Haji is welcomed in the house of Sado, but the townspeople find out about his presence and they run him out of town. The Russians agree to help Marat, and he meets them at Vostvizhenskaya. Before he arrives, there is a battle between Chechen and Dagestani forces, so when they arrive, there have been casualties. Petruka Avdeyev is among the dead. In a long side story, we learn that Petruka was the better of two brothers, and when his brother was drafted into service, Petruka went instead. We learn that Petruka's father regrets letting him go for the rest of his life, wishing he had sent the lazy worthless brother instead of the hard-working, sacrificial brother. Murat meets Prince Semyon Vorontsov and the royal family. Murat is regarded as an impressive warrior, and the royal family gives him a technically sophisticated watch which amazes him. One day, the governor general's office orders Murat to write his story down. In Murat's story, we learn that he was born in Selms. He was friends with his local cons because his mother worked as their royal wet nurse. Muridists asked for his help in a holy war against Russia. He hesitated, but agreed. Shamil, the man who has kidnapped Murat's family, was a lieutenant for the Muslims, and when they first met, Shamil humiliated Murat in front of the battalion commander, Gamzat. 
In their first attacks, they attacked Kunzik and killed the Russian officials there. Shamil's attack was reckless, and Murat's brother died, as well as Gazmet, so when Shamil asked Murat to continue fighting, Murat said he would not follow Shamil, since Shamil got him.